Uh, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I am the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. On behalf of our board of directors and our staff, we'd like to welcome you and uh, welcome our online audience as well. And it's also a pleasure to introduce and welcome our distinguished speaker and very good friend of the Jerusalem Fund, uh, Dr. Will Humans, who will be speaking about his new book, which is called An Unlikely Audience, Al Jazeera's Struggle in America. Uh, An Unlikely Audience addresses the successes and failures of the decade-long struggle of the Al Jazeera media network in the United States to investigate the inner workings of a complex news organization fighting to overcome deep obstacles, foster strategic alliances, and build its identity in the U.S. Humans argues that understanding this arc of Al Jazeera's attempt to establish itself as a national news market actually requires looking it through the lens of location. He reveals the network's appeal to American audiences by presenting its three independent U.S.-facing subsidiaries in their primary locales of production, Al Jazeera English in, uh, here in Washington, Al Jazeera America in New York, and AJ Plus in San Francisco. These cities are centers of vital industries, media politics, commercial TV news, and technology. As Humans shows, the success of the outlets uh, hinged on the locations in which they operated because Al Jazeera assimilated aspects of their core industries. An unlikely audience proves that place is critical to the formation and evolution of multinational media organizations, despite the rise of communication technologies that many believe make location less relevant. Will Humans is an assistant pr uh, professor at George Washington's universe, uh, George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. His areas of research interest include international broadcasting, Middle East politics, and Arab American studies. Humans wrote a regular column for the Gulf News, but has also been published in the Washington Post, Middle East Report, and Neiman Journalism Lab. His scholarly articles have appeared in Presidential Studies Quarterly, Communication Review, Theory and Event, and the International Journal of Communication, among others. In 2013, he received the Best Paper Award in the International Communication Section of the International Studies Association for his research on CIA, uh, CIA recruitment in Arab Detroit. Uh, after the event, copies of the book will be available for purchase, so please grab one on your way out. Um, Dr. Humans will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. And again, we ask you please um, to uh, wait till you get the mic to ask any questions so people online can hear you. Uh, and online audience can tweet their questions to our Twitter, which is at Palestine Center. Uh, and without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Will Humans. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and for uh, hosting me. I, uh, this is a place that's very close to my heart. In fact, I was an intern here in 2002, so it's nice to have this sort of homecoming. And of course, I have to thank the fund uh, and, the, and the center for, and the staff especially, for doing all the work to, to organize this. So um, I'm very much appreciated. Uh, this book, like most you know, books that come out, most authors uh, feel the same way about the book, that it's a labor of love and that, you know, we spend so much time pouring our hearts and soul into these books that we really, it's not until we put the words to the page that we really get to know kind of what we're talking about, or what we're thinking about. And so in many, way, many ways, it's a defining experience. I wanted to set the stage for this presentation just by reading a little bit out of the preface to give you a sense of where this study began which was in 2010 and I was a doctoral student at the time. Uh, that was my introduction to this news network. Of course the book is a much expanded version um, of the dissertation. There's a lot of new developments that happened since the dissertation and I spent a lot of time writing about those. Um, but I just wanted to read to you this to set the stage for why I think studying Al Jazeera matters. When I received my first gate pass granting me access to enter Al Jazeera's compound in Doha back in 2010, I could not anticipate where it would eventually take me. I was a graduate student just beginning my dissertation research. I was fascinated by Al Jazeera English from a distance, as a viewer, 
It was an experiment in international journalism that offered a notably divergent editorial perspective on a world, especially by staking out an interest in parts of the world neglected by Western news channels that claimed a global expanse, namely the BBC and CNN. Al Jazeera English claimed to be a direct challenge to the traditional patterns and the flows of global news, producing news from the global south and making it available to viewers around the world, but most subversively those of the global north. As a budding scholar concerned with the world's interrelations through media, this was an alluring promise. So I just want to build on the last point that I was getting to in that paragraph, which is Al Jazeera matters for how we, anybody in the world, but especially as Americans, how we learn about what's happening in the rest of the world, where we get our information from, and what perspectives are built into that news and information. I thought that Al Jazeera English was doing something fascinating by trying to present an alternative to the kinds of perspectives and news and information that we saw in CNN uh, and the BBC. And this was a concern that not just I had, but that scholars of international communication around the world had been talking about for decades. So Al Jazeera English was a direct sort of test uh, of how strong these patterns where news gets made in the West made by the richest, most advanced, the most powerful countries um, and exported out. Al Jazeera English was directly sort of traveling against that with its own sort of brand of, of journalism. Of course, you know, there are many critiques you can make of the network, and I address a lot of those in the book as well. But from what I was seeing as a viewer, it was the first news network to really cover all corners of the earth and to, and to get into the kinds of stories that just weren't being told by the mainstream and the most powerful sort of news networks in the country. So for me, it was a barometer. It was a test of our public sphere, of our openness to learning about the rest of the world, to our willingness to engage in uh, perspectives that, uh, that maybe were seen as adversarial or antagonistic, especially within the war on terror context. Uh, and so really my interest in my study is about the promise of international communication. And so you can, you can actually, I want to oppose two larger ways of thinking that would give us, give, give us different expectations about the success of Al Jazeera in the country. On the one hand, we've been hearing for decades about the power of globalization, right? That anybody can uh, get access to anything from any a part of the world, and this is part of the global economy. And this was something that many voices were, ch were championing, especially in the 1990s. Well, if globalization is really the way of the world, then uh, an Arab network made in Doha, made in Qatar should have no problems exporting its media content to those of us in the West. At the same time with the rise of internet technology, that was being sold to us as this gateway uh, for the world, for the exchange of information. The world could be at your fingertips. Uh, the inf information superhighway, as it was called, you know, in the late 90s. That would lead us to expect Al Jazeera's quick, rapid uh, circulation in, uh, into the West. Um, on the other hand, well, let me add one more larger sort of worldview, which would be about uh, free speech and the robustness of American um, public sphere, right? We understand that American democracy thrives on information and ideas, and that we have a very robust uh, public sphere because of the freedom of speech and the freedom of press. Therefore, we would expect that an external news network like Al Jazeera would have no problem coming into the United States. Now, to oppose that, you know, critics might say, and a lot of people who were sort of doubtful of Al Jazeera's possibilities in the U.S. would point out that um, American Islamophobia is a, is a real powerful political cultural force and that people will interpret Al Jazeera critically, adversarially, without giving it a sort of open-minded try because of the power of, of Islamophobia. And that was something that would only be heightened at, at, during the time in which Al Jazeera first made its market foray, foray into the United States, which was after September 11th, after the wars on Iraq. So you can see how there would be reason for optimism and there would be reason for pessimism. Interestingly, the network itself, Al Jazeera, had a more optimistic view when it decided to expand into the United States. Uh, this is a quick sort of uh, history just to set you up with what I focus on within the book. I don't focus so much on the Arabic channel, which really defined the brand and the, the popular associations that Americans have of Al Jazeera came because of Al Jazeera's reporting, uh, especially around the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan and then uh, the war on Iraq in 2004. Al Jazeera was seen as an enemy combatant by the U.S. administration 
uh, then Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld basically associated it with Osama bin Laden, a lot of his public uh, statements, and a lot of Americans felt like Al Jazeera was aiding the enemy. Uh, what it was doing at that time was reporting from the ground, reporting what was happening in these actual wars, and in many ways actually scooped the world in terms of being able to report on civilian casualties in Afghanistan or battle uh, losses on the part of the coalition forces. And they gave air to Taliban spokesmen. They also interviewed Osama bin Laden, which was seen as uh, controversial at the time. Um, but was something that all the networks were trying to do. Also, there was a critique that they aired um, Osama bin Laden's videotapes. So you can see how on one side, you know, within the United States, the perception was that Al Jazeera was biased against uh, the U.S. war efforts on the side of the terrorists, uh, while uh, other, other perspective would be that Al Jazeera was doing really responsible, robust, vibrant, uh, journalism. And this is something that the debate sort of went on for many years. The Bush administration had a love-hate relationship with Al Jazeera, trying to change the relationship over time. But anyways, for most Americans, the perception was that the Al Jazeera brand was something to be feared and hated and despised. Yet, uh, a lot of American news networks were taking Al Jazeera's footage and using it. There was some people in the U.S., especially within the anti-war movement, who were pining for the kind of reporting that Al Jazeera was doing. And this was apparent to many news network uh, executives at Al Jazeera. So starting with 2004, they began to think about how can we globalize, how can we internationalize, and they launched the channel Al Jazeera English, which took about two years of planning. Unlike the original channel, it would be in English, aimed at international audiences, and over time, it gained pretty wide coverage in most Anglophonic uh, countries, so Great Britain uh, and Canada to some extent. Although in Canada, there was a debate about whether Al Jazeera English should be made available, and uh, the side that was uh, supporting Al Jazeera English's availability won. In the U.S., we never had that debate, because in the U.S., we don't have a central regulator that grants licenses to foreign media companies that want to do business. Instead, we have the cable companies. Those are the key sort of gatekeeper to our media environment um, at, at the time when cable television was king. Al Jazeera English struggled to get any kinds of cable deals, and so it was largely kept off uh, American televisions at the time. That was the main way that Americans got their news. And so Al Jazeera English did expend a lot of resources trying to get into the country, but had no such luck. When they, did, when they tried to do an analysis to figure out why they were having such a hard time in the U.S., because the U.S. was such an important news market you know, for any uh, media company, um, they, they, they determined a couple different things. One of all, one, the first of all was the brand problem, uh, which I referenced earlier. And so you could think about the political context as being important. What they didn't recognize as much was that Americans maybe just aren't that interested in international news. And that is certainly the conventional wisdom of the cable industry, and that became the conventional wisdom of news reporters around the world as the mainstream American outlets were cutting back on international reporting. And so on the one hand, you might say there's anti-Arab or anti-Muslim sort of hostility that bleeds into the brand problem, but there's also just a lack of interest in international news reporting. And I, I don't know if Al Jazeera English uh, appreciated that so much. The other problem is that the cable companies really don't answer to anybody. They are the ultimate deciders of what they want to carry or not. And that's because of our particular sort of political economy of, of, of these cable companies. So Al Jazeera English was working against some very steep obstacles and over time uh, did not find any great successes in getting into the U.S. market. So it never really gained more than 5% market penetration. And this included uh, the time when, after the Arab Spring, Al Jazeera English's brand was totally revitalized because Al Jazeera English scooped the world in its coverage of the Egypt uprising. There were quotes that um, President Barack Obama was tuning into Al Jazeera English and that all the political elite had to go to Al Jazeera English to really learn what was happening in the region. And at that time, I would argue there was a shift where Al Jazeera was seen as a, uh, sort of during the Bush administration as a terrorist brand to being a brand behind the Arab Spring or being closely associated with that rebellious push for democracy as it was seen at the time. So in 2011, major transformation of the brand. People were excited about Al Jazeera English. Uh, news journalists were quoting Al Jazeera English. But did it gain widespread cable television uh, distribution as a result? It did not. 
even though Al Jazeera English launched a sort of astroturf political, you know, campaign trying to drum up demand from the public, people were submitting I demand Al Jazeera letters, you know, through their website, and they generated more than 110,000 letters to cable companies. Still, the cable companies were not interested because they didn't think that this news event and the popularity of the news source at, for this particular event would translate into an actual sustained television watching audience. Now, in a way, you know, it's disappointing, but they might have been right. It could, it could have been that at that point, the real audience for Al Jazeera English was, moved, was moving online. Yet, Al Jazeera continued to aspire to cable television as the gold standard, because that's, that's, that was seen as the way to really have influence within the American news sphere. After struggling for a couple of years after uh, the Arab Spring and seeing that that was not going to translate into a greater market share, uh, they, some, some of the executives there got the idea of launching a specifically American channel. Maybe if we de-internationalized Al Jazeera, if we made a channel that spoke really to Americans in their vernacular, maybe that would work. And so Al Jazeera America came about. Um, and so instead, they kind of lost the British accent that a lot of the, the presenters had, and they picked up um, figures, well-known figures in the American newscape, like uh, Ali Velshi and Joy Chen, for example. Um, after a few short years, however, it ended up being a financial failure. They also invested big in cable television, buying current TV, which was owned by Vice President Al Gore, as a way to get their pre-existing cable television deals. That got them into about 50 million homes. However, it didn't mean that that would be enough to generate an audience. Also, they weren't necessarily on basic cable. And the real problem, I think, is that most of Al Jazeera America's most potential audience were not watching cable television. We, we'd all sort of moved online. So they invested heavily into going after an audience that might not have been there, thus an unlikely audience. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Al Jazeera had a side bet, which was called AJ+. Plus. This was a strictly digital channel. Uh, it's, it's distributed mostly through social media, you know, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, digital-only platform. It was a small item on the budget compared to the massive expenditures that went into Al Jazeera America. Uh, it also has, unlike Al Jazeera America, a clearly defined demographic audience, which is millennials, 18 to 35, more progressive, you know, multicultural. And so they defined a space within the American news sphere. And AJ Plus has had a lot more success uh, for a lot less money. And part of that is a story of distribution. Part of that is also notice that Al Jazeera is not actually in the brand name. And so for a while it avoided some of the cultural politics um, around the branding. So that to me is the larger story of the network's efforts in the United States. Now you turn on the television set, you're not really, you're not going to see Al Jazeera. Everything is online. Television, it's not there. Um, Al Jazeera arguably isn't as influential within um, the sort of official, uh, you know, Washington D.C. Pol policy community as it was in 2012. However, AJ Plus has really given it a strong presence on Facebook and social media. Now, what does that mean for my larger question about the state of American public sphere and um, how media move in the world? Whether there's a possibility of media moving against historical patterns of Western global north sort of bias. And I think that it's a very complex question, partially because as I got into learning about these channels, as I, as I studied them, as I went to the sites in which they were being produced, I started to realize that Al Jazeera's channels were not simply these Arab or even Qatari sort of implements that were simply exported into the U.S. market and therefore were Arab or Muslim in any sort of meaningful way. Actually, the workplaces are extremely diverse, extremely complicated, multinodal in terms of having many different sort of identities at play. There's no clear, you know, there was no clear political agenda within each particular uh, network, although there were different kinds of political debates that were happening behind the scenes. And of course, Qatar's interest was always there sort of lurking in the, in the background, and we can talk about that. But I became very interested in thinking about the, sp the specific cities that each place was doing its work and how those cities actually influenced the identities of each different channel and so you could see within the workplace of each channel how much the, the city in which it took place mattered. So Al Jazeera English in terms of its American operations was in Washington DC, Al Jazeera America was in New York City, AJ Plus was in San Francisco. So let's 
instead of thinking just globally or internationally or U.S.-Arab relations through that kind of context, could we think about neighborhoods? Could we think about place? Could we think about the cities as affecting what we think about as being a global media uh, outlet? This is the neighborhood that Al Jazeera English is in. It has uh, establishment media. It, its original office, its main office in the beginning was on K Street. And we know being in Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., what K Street denotes. Influence, lobbying, it's all about being within the sort of beltway. And so I became really interested in how the logic of the beltway inflected or changed or modified the kind of work that Al Jazeera English was doing in Washington, D.C., meaning it wasn't just an extension of Doha in America, meaning that a lot of the cultural politics around Islamophobia are kind of off, right, and, and actually understanding what kind of hybridized work environment it, it was. Now, Al Jazeera America was in, uh, in New York City, uh, down here you can see Brown 9th Avenue, uh, a little south, south of Midtown, and it was in um, the heart of American television industri industry's headquarters or location, New York City. So you can see CBS Evening News, ABC News, ABC, NBC, Fox News. They're all sort of located in the neighborhood. This is just an expressionistic sort of map to give you a sense of what does it mean to sort of think locally about what it became. And then here's AJ Plus in uh, Soma, San Francisco, south of Market, in a... Uh, in a sort of new capital for the tech industry, for the technology industry. So the green dots are the, are the technology companies, red dots are uh, media companies. But what really happened in the past 20 years or so is that a lot of the San Francisco, I'm um, sorry, San Francisco became a destination for a lot of the Silicon Valley companies. They all sort of moved uh, offices there. So to what extent does that neighborhood tell us about how AJ Plus became AJ Plus? Now, the dominant rationale in D.C., as we know, is media politics. In New York City, it's traditional television news broadcasting. In San Francisco, it's digital media. So can we think about industry in these different cities as being uh, expressions or symbolic places for these industries? How much of these industries come to bear uh, on Al Jazeera? Well, in, in Al Jazeera English, what I saw quite often was that the network was trying to justify itself uh, through political validation. That is, using, uh, for example, members of the political elite as guests and flouting their sort of approval as a way to signal to the rest of the country, hey, we're okay, and guess what, we're actually you know, kind of important, right? Now, uh, this, this does make some sense because they thought that a lot of the opposition to Al Jazeera English was being driven out of Washington. Even when Al Jazeera English first launched, they sent a delegation of uh, executives to go to Congress to try to figure out if Congress was keeping them out of America. In other words, they thought that the opposition started with the Bush administration and ended with the Bush administration. And so there were a couple different, I think, defining moments where we see the media politics rationale play out. There was the Al Jazeera Forum in 2011. This is sort of a celebration of Al Jazeera's role in the Arab Spring. And we had uh, Representative Nancy Pelosi, then the uh, minority leader uh, in the House, I think majority leader maybe, and then uh, um, Senator McCain, um, obviously the Senate majority leader at the time. Both of them went to this event at the museum and were raving about how crucial Al Jazeera English was, how it was a force for freedom in the region, and how it was such an important news, uh, news source. And this came around the same time that um, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was speaking before the Senate, and she said that Al Jazeera English is doing really important news and is very crucial. And that was something that the network really championed, is saying, see, we're not a danger. We're actually very useful and beneficial. This ad ran in the Washington Post um, and I think the New York Times. And this was uh, just different kinds of endorsements. They published different endorsements from different sources, like Sam, Sam, uh, Sam Donaldson, for example, um, and this report from Business Insider that even the President of the United States is watching Al Jazeera. So I think what I'm trying to argue is that being based in Washington, D.C. prejudiced them to, to thinking that if we get political approval, this is the way into the country. In other words, the filter, one of the filters that they imagined was, uh, was the, political, the political centrality of Washington, D.C. And I, would, I compare that and I contrast that with Al Jazeera America being in New York City.
Kate O'Brien, who came over from one of the networks and was the president of Al Jazeera America, said, the formats, the talent, the producers were American. This is an American channel. How would they Americanize themselves? It would, by, it would be by attaching themselves to the broadcasting industry in New York City. Evocative of that would be the advertising campaign that it ran in uh, Times Square, these massive, huge billboards. So even the, the marketing sort of identity of El Jazeera America reflected the New Yorkness of uh, El Jazeera America as a brand. One thing I did was I looked at executives on LinkedIn, El Jazeera America's executives, where they worked previously. And about, I think, 75% of them were hired directly from New York City, showing that the industrial sort of logics, you know, carry through these individuals at the highest decision-making levels uh, of the organization. If you read my book, I get into what does that mean editorially, what kind of debates happen when you have people who are used to working in the United States, used to working in New York City's television broadcasting industry. What happens when they're debating with people who are trained at Al Jazeera English, who worked in Doha? And there's a lot of fascinating debates that happen behind the scenes, like how do you cover the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? One of the powerful things about Al Jazeera English, including its coverage you know, of, the, of Gaza at different times, is that it has a very close proximity to, uh, to this issue and covering the Palestinian narrative sort of from the ground. But that's not something that American news executives had any kind of fami familiarity with. And so this created something of an existential crisis within the newsroom uh, about, you know, are we really Al Jazeera or how are we Al Jazeera versus how are we American, right? Now, AJ Plus it was really interesting to study because it reflected place more than anything else. And I think part of this has to do with, and I write about this in the book, but the distance of San Francisco from Doha, like the number of time zones, meant that the managers in Doha are sleeping when those working in San Francisco are working. So time zones and geography as a factor for editorial independence is something that really interested me. Um, but AJ Plus in San Francisco, I mean, it was it lived and breathed San Francisco. Uh, this, this image here uh, is from a promotional video that AJ Plus put out where they actually scanned through the workplace, this old... Uh, warehouse that they that they, it was converted into a news studio. You know, it's got unfinished walls and it has um, these slogans that hang up on the wall, including some that say what it says here, inspiration. But you can see here's um, one of the uh, employees on the ground drawing out or storyboarding uh, something. You know, this is sort of the, the creative work of the tech up startup. Uh, you would never see this kind of imagery in the DC or the, or the New York kind of office of people actually working in this way, but they have bean bags and they have foosball tables and they have little M&M &M machines in the, in the pantry. Uh, after work, sometimes there would be a yoga, yoga session. Uh, in, in terms of hiring, a lot of AJ Plus employees came directly from, the, from Berkeley's School of Journalism. And that orients the outlook in a particular way. It gives it a particular socio-political outlook that one could not say is reflective of Doha. This is not Qatar's foreign policy when its earliest reports are about LGBT issues or environmentalism, right? This is a specifically uniquely kind of production that's reflective of, of the place. Um, so AJ Plus does have a more uh, progressive bent in terms of its politics. It's a little more activist. This, of course, does lead to some stresses and strife uh, with, with Doha at, ver at various times, and I write a little bit about that in the book. Um, but for the most part, you can't say it's simply an Arab thing. It's too complex. It kind of reflects, actually, the globalized, contested um, world that we live in. So in some ways, um, what I'm getting at here is that there's no simple answer to this question of is it globalization or is it xenophobia and Islamophobia? Is Al Jazeera completely excluded? No, it's not completely excluded. Was it completely embraced? Uh, no, because the cable industry and the sort of the politics of the brand sort of prevented it from being so. But online within social media, where there's a lot more pluralism, we see some opportunities for the network to gain access. But that's conditioned on it kind of Americanizing having a specific audience. I wouldn't say that AJ Plus is prestige press in the United States, but it is reaching a lot more people than any of the prior networks were able to do so. So, yeah, I, I just, I think that what I learned from Al Jazeera uh, in the United States is that, you know, first of all, we can't say that there was a blackout. We can't make, we can't overgeneralize from this story, but we can think about how, 
how much being in a particular place influences us and how we see the world, how we how what we think is important. And when we think about news organizations, they're not simple homogenous sort of entities that just reflect, you know, where they're produced, but they're actually uh, re reflective of an intermingling of different kinds of contexts. Um, and so it takes a lot of field work and a lot of uh, interviews within the workplace to make these kinds of observations. And unfortunately, 99% of the analysis I see of Al Jazeera is oversimplistic. It's, like, it's arguing that it's simply a reflection of Qatari foreign policy or it's totally biased in one way. But when you actually go look at what's happening behind the scenes, the way the sausage gets made is very complicated and actually quite more fascinating than a lot of the analysis reduces it to. Uh, so I would love to hear the kind of questions uh, that you might have um, and what your own experiences are with uh, any of these Al Jazeera channels. Uh, I know that, um, if you could just hang on a second, I know the microphone will be coming around here. Yeah. I think there was a question here in the front row. Just a quick reminder so everybody gets a chance to ask a question they may have. Please limit yourself to one question. Thank you. Oh, you're just killing me now. <laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, what was Qatar's intention in setting up and financing Al Jazeera? And second, uh, I'm sorry about this, but the Saudis and others are asking Qatar to drop Al Jazeera. That's one of their demands. How likely will that happen? Very Two good. Two short questions are all right, too. That was terrific. Those are great questions. Um, basically, I, I start out my conclusion, I, uh, strangely, about getting addressing that, the sort of larger geopolitics of why Al Jazeera exists. And it really goes back to the coup uh, in the mid-1990s, where uh, Amir, the Emir basically was out of the country, and his son, who was more of a modernist, more, of a, more interested in sort of developing Qatar's you know, resources, actually staged the coup against his father. The Saudis were not happy about that. Saudi, re Saudi regional media started blasting the new emir. And so the new emir really thought, you know, maybe I need my own horse in this race. And, and at the, there was another, so there was that sort of geopolitical interest and in, in actually trying to stoke out some independence from the Saudi sphere of control. But at the same time, there was a failed media venture that the Saudis um, were exploring with the BBC. It actually got close to launching this channel and there were a bunch of BBC trained Arab, Arab journalists who were gonna launch this new venture, but then the Saudis got cold feet and started putting some editorial restrictions on it and the BBC was not okay with that. So the project fell apart. But it left this pool of, you know, Arab journalists with sort of no place to go. And, and I don't know the exact details of how it came about, but that formed the nucleus for Al Jazeera Arabic's launch in 1996. And so that geopolitics that has come out in the, the most recent uh, controversy has a long history to it. In many ways, uh, Al Jazeera is an expression of, of Qatar's yearning for its own sort of uh, prestige and influence within the region. Now, does that mean that Al Jazeera always reports exactly what Qatar's perspective is? You know, that's changed over the years. That's not a, a static question. There are various times where Al Jazeera is sort of doing its own thing and putting a lot of diplomatic heat on Qatar. There's times where Qatar reigns in and you see Al Jazeera being more of a mouthpiece, actually, in terms of the Arabic channel. English has a little more of a complicated history because the regional geopolitics don't play into Al Jazeera English as much. But there's definitely this longer story that both your questions hint, hint at. And if so, to really make sense of what happened more recently, you have to understand the origins of it in the larger political contest. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Dr. Yamas. Very interesting presentation. <clears throat> I was interested in learning more about the um, role the cable companies play yeah. in selecting or not selecting a network to air. It seems to me that there are quite a few channels that cannot possibly command more audience than Al Jazeera does yeah. that are already in cable. Yeah. How does that work? That's a great question. Uh, for one thing, the cable companies see the number of channels that they uh, have as real estate. And so if you offer it to one channel, you have to exclude another channel. So the question would be, I mean, aren't there some terrible channels that nobody watches that are so unpopular that Al Jazeera might actually be an improvement on that? And there was a great article, I think, in 2012 or so that actually looked at what are the lowest rated 
cable channels, and some of them I never even heard of, and they commanded maybe 20,000, 17,000 people a night. Terrible. Actually, current TV was among the lowest at that time. I think they had about 25,000 a night when Al Jazeera actually bought the channel. And so you thought, oh, this is like, this is an easy economic sort of decision. Well, there was a couple problems, which is uh, Al, uh, Al Jazeera, okay, so cable companies get the revenues, a couple means, there's subscriptions, and then there's, they sell advertising, right? And so subscriptions, and then there's also the kind of fee that comes out of the, what, what the channel, uh, I'm sorry, the fee of what subscribers actually pay. So I guess that's the same thing as subscriptions. Uh, but essentially, if they thought that Al Jazeera would cost some subscribers or that they wouldn't be able to sell advertising on uh, programs run by Al Jazeera, then they would take an economic hit, even if it, they were getting a larger audience. So cable companies, they care about ratings to the extent that it's profitable for them. Right? But if they're going to lose subscriptions because of protesters, or if they're not going to be able to sell local advertising because no one wants their, program, you know, no one wants their ads running on, on this controversial channel, then they lose money. So the economic calculus is that there's low, there's low reward and there's higher risk for carrying Al Jazeera, even if you could probably get a larger audience than you could for, I don't know, you know the pet food channel or whatever. No, no offense to anyone who might watch <laughs> that uh, channel. But yeah, the economic calculus is kind of really interesting. And overall, these cable companies are risk averse. The larger companies, especially, they they don't. They, first of all, they don't want to anger. Uh, they don't want to anger viewers who might be offended. And so, if five percent of the population is really anti Al Jazeera and really hates them. You know, that could be uh, a significant risk for cable companies. Thanks. Uh, so thanks for the good talk and uh, congratulations on, on the book. Um, so y you, th you mentioned the millennial audience for AJ Plus, right? And I'm on the very old end of millennials. I'm at the very cusp of it. Yeah, and, right. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, right. And, and a fellow media scholar. And I can tell you I was streaming Al Jazeera English constantly when it was available. And um, right, and then they cut off the streaming access when they launched Al Jazeera America. Because, but that was, as you noted, right when people unplugged, right, for their cable. Yes. And I'm wondering if you might think that that was a, a pretty severe miscalculation on their part to to not keep that momentum going for for streaming uh, Al Jazeera English. That, that's a terrific point because it was it was such a bad decision on the outside, right? And so I got two answers to this. The first answer I got was that, well, the cable company contracts obviously would restrict that because if, cable, if the cable companies are allowing programmers that they carry to stream too much online, then why are people going to subscribe? They're not going to have a net gain of subscribers, right? So uh, that's one explanation. And I, and I did find some support that that was the case. And that's not just for Al Jazeera, it's for all channels. But they, at that time, they were trying to prevent online streaming from happening. The other thing is, well, that's for Al Jazeera America, but what about Al Jazeera English, which the cable companies aren't interested in carrying, and as long as you limit Al Jazeera English's non-Al Jazeera America also carried content to stream, then, th then that's not a problem, for, that shouldn't be a problem for cable companies, right? That's what I asked. And they said, well, okay, so what I got was, we think that if we cut off the Al Jazeera English stream, that that would push people to subscribe to cable and therefore to watch Al Jazeera America. And I said, I wouldn't do that. I'm not going to pay $70 a month to get all these channels just so then I can also get Al Jazeera America when before I had Al Jazeera English, you know. So I, I actually subscribed through my office, through my workplace. And because I was researching them, you know, it's part of that budget. But I, I, it just seemed a severe miscalculation, and it wasn't based on any kind of audience research. They didn't do a survey where they asked, you know, how many of you are willing to pay extra to watch uh, Al Jazeera America? So it, it reflected to me a deep lack of understanding of, of the audience. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed uh, uh, your position that it's too uh, deterministic to think that you know it's Islamophobia or it's this or it's that. Um, but I, wa I worked for Al Jazeera English for a time. And um, I do think that to a certain degree there is a very strong uh, ideological factor here, especially with respect to Islamophobia. Um, I know that it is too deterministic to think of uh, these things in, 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 um, in one way. And um, maybe uh, in your book, the, the, the point that you're trying to make is that uh, I Islamophobia does play a part, but it's not you know, as, uh, as, yeah. as huge as it is. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, to what extent do you think that this issue was a, a very ideological? You know, I remember 
uh, telling uh, family members of mine that I was working for Al Jazeera and it was like sort of this cringe moment where they're like, mm, like I don't know, like yes. what is that about? Or uh, even uh, when the news network was suffering from bad PR with respect to sexual harassment in the workplace and sort of painting this pic uh, picture of like, you know, a patriarchal uh, Arab manager sort of harassing these American women in the workplace and yeah, this sort of sure. stuff. So, I mean, to a certain degree, I do think there was this uh, very cent central like Orientalist and, and uh, Islamophobic uh, yeah, image. Very good, very good. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I do write about that a lot. And, you know, I even write about Orientalism in terms of the branding thing. And I should let you know that, you know, I've, I actually did an experiment. It's not, I think I cite it in the book because I published it elsewhere, where I showed American audiences an Al Jazeera report with Al Jazeera's brand on it. And I showed them the same report but put CNN's brand on it just mm -hmm. to see how they respond. And, you know, when they saw it with the CNN report, they thought it was a much more credible piece of reporting. And what predicted that, well, I also tested for uh, prejudice towards Arab Americans as a sort of proxy for Islamophobia. And it correlated, you know, extremely highly. You know, so for me, it was fairly obvious that Islamophobia was, was driving a lot of the audience's bias. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about media bias, but we don't talk about audio audience bias enough, which is they're not even willing to watch with an open mind this clip just because it has one logo on it as opposed to another logo, you know. And, you know, we all fall victim to that in some sense because we're bombarded by so many different options. Brand becomes the heuristic. It's the shorthand for how we know what we want to watch and what we don't want to watch because how else can we navigate this crazy media environment where there's so much coming at us? So to some extent, I am sympathetic, not for the Islamophobic motivations of it or the Islamophobic uh, interpretation of it, but just because that's how we make sense of things. Brands do help us, you know, make quick decisions. Um, but yeah, no, I, I in the book, I, I, I say that this is a real thing that really matters, Islamophobia. So when I focus on the locality of it, it's not to um, downplay it, it's just to, the larger analysis that it's one sort of consideration, it's one sort of obstacle. And I, and I say that Orientals, it's kind of interesting because Orientalism sets us up to think that Al Jazeera is likely to fail. And for the most part, you know, it was right in terms of Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera America. But what the other interesting thing is, is that if you look at Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington, which is very much opposed to Orientalism, the perspectives that Said and Huntington were writing from, Clash of Civilization gives us the same expectation, which is that those in the West will be op oppositional to something that comes out of the Muslim world. So it's kind of a, one of those rare instances where you can get Edward Said and Samuel Huntington to agree <laughs> on something. Yeah, uh, so, but thank you for the question. Hi, I'm a great fan of Al Jazeera.com, which I watch on YouTube. One of you comment on the attacks that I see. One, I see it on YouTube. Some out of the blue will come a statement, uh, Al Jazeera and Qatar are supporting terrorism. Or I see full page ads in the newspapers, saying same thing, yeah. and it will say, list something on the bottom, Bahrain, you know, a source. Yeah. Very, yeah, no, very good question. I mean, you have to keep in mind that because of the geopolitics of it, there are a lot of uh, moneyed interests who are very intent on um, attacking uh, Qatar through the lens of, you know, of, of asshole attacking Al Jazeera in a sense. So there's a, there is a sort of geopolitics to it. Now what's, what's frustrating to me about that is that it clouds the, the real critiques that we could make of bias within Al Jazeera's media coverage. In a way, they sort of ridiculously sort of politicize it because of because these critiques are so detached from what's actually going on. I mean, I've seen ads that are linking Qatar to North Korea. Like, is it that's yeah. is that really? I mean, are, do we are we idiots to think that Qatar is behind you know the Kim Jong Un regime? And it's just the sort of you know desperate sort of PR pitch. And maybe for some people it works. My guess is that it works for people who are already predisposed to sort of despising everything sort of Qatari. But if you really watch Al Jazeera English with an open mind um, and, and open eyes, I mean, it's very hard to detect the overt sort of Qatari bias. It's actually in very subtle ways. You know, what does it not report on? It doesn't report as vigorously on, you know, the guest worker abuse and the deaths in the World Cup. Um, it doesn't report on, you know, the lack of, of, of rights, civil rights, or uh, lack of um, non-resident sort of rights within Qatar, you know, and, and so and even like maybe the FIFA corruption scandal, for example. To me, these are all very real solid critiques that should be put forward, and, and you know, as a viewer of Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera and AJ Plus, you know, I would like to hold its feet to the fire with these critiques. 
But this whole, you know, PR aspect of the sort of war of interests, you know, between the UAE and the Saudis and Egypt and Qatar, to me it's absurd. And it's so distracted, such a distraction from the real problems facing the region. Um, and it's too bad that so much of that gets fought out in proxies and that people get killed over that battle for influence that to me my, maybe has more to do with egos than actual real interests, unfortunately. And it's a sad state of affairs, you know, in the region because of this, in, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's, that campaign against Al Jazeera is not just funded by, hasn't just been funded by geopolitical adversaries, but there have been um, American conservative groups that spent a lot of money and uh, energy um, attacking Al Jazeera early on, trying to say that it's corrupt and that's a reflection of, you know, Al Qaeda's sort of voice and mouthpiece in the U.S. And none of it was ever based on real research or sustained attention to Al Jazeera's content. Sometimes they can point out and cherry pick examples where Al Jazeera does something awful in terms of its coverage and they use that to say well this is the defining moment for Al Jazeera but if it was really defining you'd have a lot more examples you would not have to pick an example every three or four years to sort of use against uh, the channel and network but that said you know I'm not an overt fan of the network I think that we should hold it responsible and we should be critical and we should point out when it's wrong as we should with all new sources Time for two more questions. Okay. You asked about our experiences with Al Jazeera. Since I don't get cable, I have never seen the station. But I go to the Democratic Republican conventions every four years, and I have seen it there. Yes. Um, but it was not there in, at the last 2016. Oh, interesting. Yes, I, was, I looked for it. Yeah. Um, but it was not there. Previously, it had a big press box right next to all the other big press box with a big sign yeah. saying Al Jazeera. I think, I think I have a couple of photographs of it. First of all, which one was it? At the time, I did not know there were so many different Al Jazeera's. Uh, secondly, at the risk of sounding naive, what was it doing there? Those, oh. at, least the, at least 08 and 12, but not in 16 what was it, what was it trying to do by covering american budgets i'm not sure about, about 2016 but it, it reported it reported on the conventions regularly both the republican convention and the democratic national convention what's interesting is that there are several episodes in its history uh, where there's controversies at the democratic national convention more so than the republican national convention um, i wanted to read one that i write about on page 86 uh, I wrote, emblematic anecdotes portrayed this bipartisan discomfort with AJE. At the 2008 Democratic National Convention, the party chairman, Howard Dean, was making the rounds to appear on various media. Steve Clemens, a political observer and later editor at The Atlantic, relayed that Dean walked into AJE's booth, which the network shared with Fox. Uh, fun, fun, funny enough. But, quote unquote, when he realized it was Al Jazeera, he reeled out of there and fairly rudely. Uh, there was another episode, I think that was 2012, where uh, Al Jazeera English was covering the convention, I think in 2012, and they had to put a banner up, and some people from the Democratic National Convention freaked out and ordered them to take the banner down, despite it being something that they had sort of contractually agreed upon earlier. So I, I, I had originally wrote that in the beginning of the introduction about the banner, but I don't think the banner story actually made the cut finally. But um, you know, it's not without controversy that they were doing simple reporting. And I think that that also fed the impression that this was somehow something that the political elite or validation at the level of the political elite could fix for them. Which one was oh, these, both Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera would usually send reporters. And because of your... Yeah, it, 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 it might have been both. At different, sometimes they would be sent very separately. Sometimes the teams would be more integrated when they cover the, the conventions. But yeah, I'm not sure about the specific convention to which you're referencing. Well, I, I mean, I can find out which one I want. I mean, they yeah. Always, yeah. Well. I don't, I don't know that much. But yeah, they carry out regular journalistic duties and cover these kinds of news events like anyone else. Well, the Al, Al Jazeera Arabic would, would cover it for the Middle Eastern audience, for the Arabic speaking audience. Al Jazeera English would do it for the international English speaking audience. So. Thanks, Will. Um, I was wondering if, they, if, if you know if there was ever any conversation uh, about 
you know, the decision to come into the American market around changing the name of the oh. network before going on air and, and why it was that they decided against that. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I think about this is because when you look at sort of other uh, subsidiaries of, of the media network, uh, they made the decision when going into the European market for sports, for example, to change from the uh, Al Jazeera sports network to BN TV. Uh, and when you, when you watch BN TV now, for example, there's no direct way of knowing that it's connected to Absolutely. Al Jazeera. So I'm wondering what, what changed? You know, what, 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 why was the decision calculus so different uh, when we know very well what kind of uh, challenges uh, exist in the American market when it comes to Islamophobia and, and, and anti-Arab racism and so on? Uh, because I'm really exhausted, I'm just going to cheat and read the paragraph. But that's a, that is a great question. Uh, even Russia Today switched to RT at some point to try to cleanse uh, the brand. So, <clears throat> under the direction of Tony Berman, the second managing director of AJE, a team of staff began the quote-unquote America's Project to examine how to attract more interest in the United States. The participants brainstormed ideas about what hindered the company. They drafted a memo and raised as a chief concern the branding problem. In the United States, there is quote-unquote confusion about the relationship between Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English. American commentators, politicians, cable executives, and the public frequently pose this question as a coded means of finding out whether AJE would assume a similar editorial outlook, implying adversarial, rebellious, or anti-American. This incentivized the channel to distinguish itself from the separate Arabic channel, but this presented AJE with the quandary. If it tried to emphasize its independence to appear more palatable to American tastes, it would appear apologetic and might validate misrep misperceptions of the Arabic content held by many who could not even understand the content. Internally, this was a very sensitive issue. Stressing the differences or changing the brand from Al Jazeera would insult the Arabic channel's personnel, some of whom were arrested, injured, or saw colleagues such as Tariq Ayyub killed reporting for that network to build the brand. They sacrificed to build the very brand some saw as a liability to AJE's market aspirations. The confusion about the relationship between the Arabic and the English channels was more than a symbolic problem. It interfered with AJE's distribution efforts. As the memo related, quote unquote, one result is that distributors are wary of the potential commercial and PR risks of carrying the channel. So at some point, there was an internal strife actually over this very issue and the sort of integrity of the brand, the idea that they could revitalize the brand and that people would sacrifice themselves to make that brand. In other words, the unity uh, around the news ish, around the news brand of Al Jazeera, I think, won the day. The idea was that you know that brand should stand for a certain kind of journalism, no matter the language. You know, with the sports channel, which is outside of the entire news sort of company, you know, Al Jazeera Sport was very much, very easily, you know, wasn't part of that consideration at all. And so when they switched to BN, it was really to protect the investment. I mean, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars, I believe, on securing La Liga exclusive broadcast rights in the U.S. and Europe. And so they're not going to risk, you know, keeping the Al Jazeera brand there. So that's a, that's a good question. Along the same lines, when you d you said you did an experiment, uh, did you uh, also test, you know, besides CNN and Al Jazeera, did you have one that was just a random made-up acronym, for example, uh, to see if uh, yeah. if it's the brand recognition or if it's Al Jazeera specifically? Wow, that's such a good methods question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did we have a true control group? Is what you're asking, actually? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no comment. <laughs> well, it's published, so yeah, we didn't quite do a, I don't think we had a control control, which would have been actually no branding, I think. Uh, okay. So that was actually a deep mythological flaw with that piece. I think that's maybe why I didn't put it in the book, I would like to say, but yeah. <laughs> Why'd you have to do that, Mohammed? So, so, that's, that's not a good thing for a host to do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Strike at the heart of my study. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? <laughs> any, any softball questions? <laughs> you asked for our impressions of uh, Al Jazeera English. 
We had it for a very few years here on broadcast TV and it became available um, through the HD programming. Mm -hmm. And it was a great and a very pleasant surprise to have a news channel that was not US news oriented and to see different parts of the world and so thoroughly reported. Um, I saw one or two programs that were very um, Islam specific in terms of documentaries or uh, personality pieces and uh, they were very interesting as well. So I was quite unhappy when it stopped being aired on the megahertz network. Yeah. That's right. Oh, and, and the last point that you make is important that it was aired through megahertz. So megahertz is an independent company that redistributes content from international sources. And so Al Jazeera actually had a deal with megahertz. Megahertz had to deal with the cable companies. So when people say, well, I used to watch Al Jazeera English in Washington, D.C., so they're not completely excluded by the cable companies, um, I tell them, well, in Washington, D.C., it only got in, not through the cable company deal, but through this sublease uh, sort of deal or arrangement with uh, with megahertz. Same thing with New York. When it actually got into New York, it was through uh, a third party that actually had to deal with cable. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think that it was such an important source in Washington, D.C. And one thing I write about it is audience. Uh, I write about what were the audience sizes. And most of its viewership or the largest market for it was Washington, D.C. So it was in the Beltway more than just on production. It was also within the Beltway in terms of the audience that it really influenced and spoke to, I think. I, I, heard. I heard that it was only in two major media markets in yeah. the whole nation yeah. when it was on broadcast TV. That's right, New York City and uh, Washington, D.C. It had a few direct cable deals. So actually, uh, Buckeye Cable in Toledo, Ohio, because the owner just said, I like it, I'm going to show it. You know, this is not Comcast or Time Warner. And then Burlington Telecom, which has a very interesting story about it. I wrote a paper about it. It was actually started in part by Bernie Sanders when he was the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. They had a fascinating local debate about whether the local municipally funded, municipally backed telecom, whether they should offer Al Jazeera English. And they did it in a good old-fashioned sort of New England town hall way where they brought people together and they had a discussion, they had a debate. And uh, I wrote a paper analyzing the, the, what the actual debate was. And it was fascinating to me because it showed how a different kind of system, a different kind of politi political economy around media might produce a more democratic media. Because here the public came to, and they actually started arguing about whether Al Jazeera English was good journalism or whether it was propaganda. And those who wanted to see it argued so much, there were so much more of them. And they were saying, look, this is freedom of choice. Let us decide. Who are you to tell us what we can and can't see? This is something that would never happen with the dominant private sector cable industries. So in that way, political economy came to determine what was really available w w within most, uh, most communities without them ever having get, getting a chance to even see what the, the fuss was all about. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Will, very much for the interesting thank presentation. You for, yeah, thank, thank you, you for the much. great questions. Thank, thank you all for coming. Me. Great question. Great question. I feel like I couldn't give it justice, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good.